Hello, we're really sorry about the technical issues we've been having, so we thought we would just start from the beginning, and so here is our first, our day three of Zoology Live. Hello and welcome back to day three of Zoology Live from the Museum of Zoology. I'm Ros Wade, I'm the Learning Officer at the Museum and I'm your guide on this wonderful week of wildlife. We would really love to know what you think of Zoology Live, so if you have the time to fill out our online survey, please do, there's a link to it in the show notes below and also on our blog. So far we've been exploring the wonderful world of insects and other mini beasts and these are going to feature today as we go pond dipping with Dr. Francis Dipper and we learn about wildlife filmmaking with Ellie Bladen. Now I see that we've had some really beautiful butterfly artwork sent in to us inspired by yesterday's Zoology Live. we really love to know what you've been making, so please do get in touch if you've been inspired this week at all. We've been setting a series of challenges this week. And if you go to our blog, you can find out details about our wildlife challenge where we're asking you to add your sightings to iRecord so that we can build up a picture of the wildlife on our doorsteps. We also have our Recycled Makes challenge and our Lego challenge. You can find out details on how to enter these on our blog, but what we'd like you to do is to be inspired by the wildlife on your doorstep to make some fabulous creatures out of these materials. If you share your images with us, we will be uh, showing them on the shows on Saturday, and also we can enter you into our prize draw for a mini wildlife explorer kit. And so to today's Zoology Live. We're going to start off with a trip to the garden pond of Dr. Francis Dipper. And remember, we'll be talking to our experts after their films, so do put your questions in the comments on YouTube here. Hello, I'm Francis Dipper, and I'm a marine biologist stranded inland in Cambridgeshire. <clears throat> but what I do have is a wonderful pond and I'm hoping today to take you round my pond, show you some of the things that live in it and some of the things that live around it. So, first of all, what do I need? I need some equipment in order to take you down below the surface and show you what's there. So, I'll show you what I need. A pair of wellies, a white tray and a net. The pond, as you can see, is quite large. It attracts all sorts of wildlife. Moorhens, toads, newts, frogs, and even grass snakes. And this morning I saw a thrush catching worms along the damp mud at the edge. There's also a lot of plants around it, and some of those have flowers that attract the bees. So I have bees, butterflies, and at night time the bats fly around catching the insects. So my catch this morning was quite good, I was really pleased. I got out a lot of weed, which is where a lot of the invertebrates hide. And I hope you can see, if I just use my trusty spoon to move the weed aside, that hidden away amongst the weeds and reeds of my pond are dragons, but instead of breathing fire, they breathe in the water. And this is actually a nymph, or a juvenile stage, of a dragonfly. <coughs> they live for about three years under the water, and during that time they feed on all the little insects, other insects, larvae, and um, little worms, or whatever they can catch, basically. He's quite still at the moment because he doesn't really like being out in the in the pond, out of the pond, I should say. Let's see if we can make him walk a little. I don't want to disturb him too much. 
There we are. At least that shows that he's alive and well. He's going to stay there, as I say, for about three years and then he'll crawl out onto a stem, crawl up the stem into the air, dry out a bit and then eventually his skin will split and over a few hours the adult's going to emerge. We call them nymphs instead of larvae because they grow gradually, whereas a larva like a butterfly larva, i.e. a caterpillar, undergoes a sudden metamorphosis and changes quickly. This is another, another nymph, not a larva, and this time we're looking at, instead of a dragonfly, a damselfly. So a much finer, slimmer animal, and this one has three tails shaped rather like a goose's feather. And right next to him you can see one of these little worms I was talking about, and that's actually the larva of a biting midge. And these make great food for all sorts of animals in the pond. There he comes, back again. And then just down here was my other find of the morning. Which, if I can find him, there we go. Is, an, is a, the larva, the tadpole of a newt. So it's a newt pole. There he is, and if you look really carefully, you might be able to see his gills, because he has gills to begin with. And of course, when he comes out of the water, he's going to turn into a, an adult. Those gills are going to be absorbed and his legs will grow. There are plenty of other things in the pond as well. And I don't know how many of these you can see, because there, there's, there's, there's one going across. All sorts of larvae more difficult to identify and better put under a microscope or, a, or a, um, even a magnifying glass will help hugely. But perhaps you can see all the little tiny moving dots in the water and those are things like water fleas, daphnia and, and um, little other crustaceans and also some beetles, little swimming beetles. I had hoped to get a water boat moment, but I don't think I managed that today. Yes, I did. There he is, a little tiny one. Some of these are called upside down swimmers because they swim on their back and some species swim on their front. And there's the moorhen. She doesn't come out very much at the moment. She's sitting on her nest, keeping her eggs warm. Just comes out for occasional feed. And I'm so glad we saw her, and I hope you've enjoyed your visit to my wildlife pond as much as I do. Goodbye. Now hopefully this will work, we've had a few technical issues today, but I'm just going to try and uh, connect with our pond dipping expert, uh, Francis Dipper. If this doesn't work, um, we will go on to uh, learning about some wildlife pond making. Hello Francis, is this working? Okay, unfortunately it's not quite working yet, so we'll hopefully be able to come back to Francis later. So in the meantime we've got something that's a little bit different. One of the PhD students in the Department of Zoology, Ellie Bladen, is also a fantastic wildlife filmmaker and she's going to share with us now some of her top tips for making a wildlife film on a budget. Hi, I'm Ellie Bladen and today I'm going to be talking you through my top five tips for making wildlife films on a budget. Making wildlife films is a really fun and constructive way to engage with the nature around you, whether that's right here in your garden, in a local park or in an urban centre. Now I'm a full-time PhD student so I don't have whatever cash I like to splash on the best gear, so I have to be a little bit innovative when it comes to my shooting but luckily these days smartphones have really amazing cameras and if you have an SLR for photography they usually have a film mode which is more than good enough for putting on YouTube or sharing on social media so you can do a lot with things you already have lying around. First 
first of all, we need to think of an idea for our film. Maybe you've got loads of them already. But once you've decided what to focus on, you need to learn as much about it as possible. Let's say that I want to make a film about starlings in suburban environments. Well, the first thing I have to do is learn all about starlings in this type of environment. Firstly, it means that you'll be better able to decide what the story behind your film is, because you'll find out what's really interesting about them. Secondly, knowing more about your focal species will tell you what kinds of clips you want to get. In your film, you won't only want to show the animal itself, but its habitat too. So by knowing what the animals eat and where they live, you'll know what other shots you need to get to create a nice rounded story. Thirdly, it'll give you an idea of how best to film your species. So practical things like where to find it and what the best time of day to film it is. One of the most unsettling things is when you're watching a film and the image is all shaky, just like this. One way to make your film look instantly more professional is to steady your camera. If you've already got a tripod, brilliant. But you can also get them secondhand from sites like eBay or Gumtree, really reasonably priced. Or if you're using a phone to do your film, you can get something like a Gorillapod, which grips onto something in your environment and then on your phone to steady it. Or if you're ready to scale up a bit, you could try something like a smartphone gimbal. These steady your camera perfectly. And they're really good if you want to present the film yourself because you can be on camera and walking without the footage going up and down. Of course, if you're just starting out, there's no need for something like this. We're just doing it for fun after all. And if you don't want to spend anything at all, then just find a really good place to put your camera down and steady it so that your footage is nice and smooth. We don't want to make our audience seasick after all. Obviously wildlife films need great visuals, but great sound can also add a huge amount of atmosphere. Now if you're recording on a DSLR or a camcorder, you'll probably notice that like this, you're getting a lot of background noise and some whirring from the camera itself. Now if you don't want to invest in any sound equipment, one thing you could do is to get a separate device, something like a dictaphone or a mobile phone, and record the sound separately and then lay it over the top. Most smartphones have a pretty good microphone on them, so this is a great start for recording ambient sound. Again, let's say I want to create a film about starling behaviour. I'll record my footage, but I'll also have an audio recording device placed in the garden at the same time, recording all their chirping and screeching. And it's this audio, not the audio picked up by the camera, that I'll use in my final film. make our film interesting to watch, not just in terms of the story, but also from a visual perspective. Now, if you're just starting out, you're not going to be using drones or fancy sliders to get all those different shots, but you can create a really interesting film visually just by varying the angle of your camera. On the most basic level, think about getting wide shots, medium shots and close up shots. And in terms of angles, you can vary whether you're at eye level, looking up or looking down on your focal species or their habitats. Maybe you also want to include some point of view shots where you place the camera in the environment at the height and angle that your species would be at to give the audience an idea of what the species might see. You might not want to use all of these angles and shots in one short film. We don't want to overwhelm our audience after all. But mixing up a few different angles and shots can give the audience a different perspective on the species, keep them engaged and add to our story. So you've got all your footage and it's now time to make it into a film. This is where the editing magic happens and you turn all those bits of footage into a story. You don't need to jump straight into buying expensive paid for software. There are some really good free ones out there to start you off. If you have an Apple Mac, you can start off with iMovie. It's simple and perfect for starting out with editing. I still do some of my very quick edits in iMovie. If you don't have a Mac or you fancy something with more functionality, you can try the free software DaVinci Resolve. I will say that when I first started editing, I did find DaVinci quite overwhelming. It's just got so much functionality and so many options. But 
there are loads of good YouTube videos out there to help you navigate it, so it'll be second nature in no time. Anyway, those are my top five tips for making wildlife films on a budget. Of course, there's so much more that you could learn, but these will put you far on your way to making wildlife films that you can share with your friends and family, and maybe even enter into an amateur filmmaking competition. Now it's just time for you to get out there and see what you can capture in your local patch. And now I'm joined live by Ellie Bladen, and it's great to see the tech is working. Hi, Ellie. Hi, how are Hi. you? It's actually working from my side. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much for that film. It was really, really interesting. Can I ask you, how did you first get into uh, making wildlife films? Uh, well, I've always loved watching wildlife documentaries. So like many people, I grew up watching a lot of David Attenborough. And he, good wildlife films have this wonderful way of you know taking science and making it visual and showing why non-scientists should care about it and so I started off like for me I started off uh, doing photography as a hobby and I sort of thought there were some things like some behaviors I couldn't capture properly in film um, so initially I went on a couple of wildlife filming short courses and um, they were run through Wild Eye which is a um, a company based in Norfolk um, and then that sort of built up a basic skill base and that was a few years ago now so since then it's been a case of thing with different techniques talking to some other filmmakers um, and just generally looking out for interesting stories that I want to focus the film on. So are there any particular sort of documentaries or sequences in documentaries that you find inspiring? So it's probably a bit of a cliche because this got a lot of press when it first came out, but um, I absolutely love the Galapagos marine iguanas versus snakes sequence from Planet yes. Earth 2 that a lot of people are probably quite familiar with. Um, it's, just, it's just a case of incredible footage and incredible editing and incredible music all added together. Um, and when I see a clip like that, I, I like to think about how much each of those elements goes into making you feel the way you do about it. Um, so yeah. for anyone who hasn't seen it, just just Google iguana versus snakes. Um, I think BBC <laughs> Earth have uploaded it. Um, but it's actually quite stressful to watch because essentially you're seeing these freshly hatched uh, marine iguanas running for their life across a beach. Um, and the you know when you get obviously it's amazing footage to capture, but but the editing and the music create this real sense of of dread and suspense. Um, mm -hmm. So. Yeah, it's a very powerful scene, and I'd recommend that to anyone who hasn't seen it. Yeah, it's one of my favourites, that one as well, definitely. We've got a couple of questions that are coming in. So, Verity, aged six, asks how to make the story of your film interesting. Oh, that's a really good question. So I'd say, first of all, think about why you're interested, because there's probably a reason that you're wondering about making a film about this particular animal or, or plant, you know, or habitat. Um, so if you're interested in it, then, then probably other people will be too. And it's just really about um, communicating that interest. So I think it kind of goes back to um, saying about one of the tips is learn as many things as possible, because then you can sort of start with that initial interest. And then as you learn more about it, you'll probably find that there are loads of interesting things, um, you know, whether it's the way it behaves, where it lives, all that kind of stuff. So I find with nature, it's rare that you won't find anything interesting. Yeah, absolutely. So um, this is another question that's come through. Can you give me some tips on photography and also what camera should I use since my maximum price is £40? That sounds like quite a challenge. That is that is a challenge. I'd say um, if, you, if you're looking at a maximum price of around £40, I'd probably just advise using what you've got already. Um, mm -hmm. So a lot of people have smartphones um, and I'd say it's probably worth um, just sort of starting with your smartphone because they can be really good these days. You can get amazing um, photography and maybe even have a little look at some free editing software to make the most out of um, you know post uh, post processes. Because um, forty pounds for for a camera, you, you're not going to get um, an SLR, which is sort of your typical bulky camera. Um, so I'd say I'd say probably make the best of what you've got and maybe just sort of save up long term. For something else. 
Yeah. So one thing um, I've always found when I'm watching wildlife is that a little bit of patience goes a really long way. I'm guessing the same is true when you're trying to film it as well. Yes, uh, definitely. So, I mean, it's it, wildlife is generally shy of humans. Um, so if you pitch up with your camera, everything initially is going to try and run or fly away. Um, so it's a case of sitting, sitting quietly and waiting. And um, I guess, again, this goes back to the, the idea of learning about your species because um, you can sort of learn in advance where the best place to film it is and the best time so that you can sort of minimize the time you're spending waiting you're not you know you're not going to be sitting somewhere waiting for something that's never going to happen um, so like an example is uh, you know if you're filming bumblebees in your garden you could have a look at which flowers they go to a lot um, and then focus it on a particular flower that you often see the bumblebees going to and just leave it focused there and wait basically mm -hmm. it's much it's much easier than trying to like move your hammer around and and find something yeah okay great really great tips and um, how much footage do you think you take in order to make a film does a lot get sort of left on the cutting room floor do you think um it, so for the film you just saw um because I was presenting it and um, you know I, I was able to just plan it in advance, uh, not very much ended up on the floor at all, um, so I, I just shot what I needed. Um, but with the Dormouse film, which I think we'll be seeing later, um, mm -hmm. that was a much bigger project. Um, so I spent months filming that because I wanted to get the whole sort of life cycle in a year of um, Dormouse monitoring and conservation. So with that, um, the problem I found was I wanted to enter it into a competition which had a maximum length of 15 minutes, which meant that I did end up having to um, not use a whole segment about um, winter time uh, habitat conservation. So in that case, it well, you know, some really some footage that I really liked um, did end up going on the cutting room floor. Um, and I'd say generally, if I'm filming a species and I want to make a film ab about sort of the species in general, I will get a lot of habitat footage and footage of an other animals in its environment and I try to get as much as, as possible of that so that I have choices so inevitably some of it's not going to get used for that film. Yeah now and um, so I've got another question that's come through it must be so hard trying not to interfere when something is hunting something else do you find that? Yeah so um, I've I guess been in a, a lucky position where I haven't had anything I haven't seen any mammals hunting each other for example and I think when it's mm. mammals or at least big animals you tend to feel a bit more sympathy um, so I've mainly done sort of smaller things and insects and when it's insects you've got no chance of trying to intervene anyway um, but yeah I think it is really difficult for um, filmmakers and, and you hear about this on, on you know planet earth and planet earth 2 when I think it was planet earth 2 when they had the uh, the penguins that they had they decided to mm -hmm. save you've got to make a decision as to whether it's um you know are you stopping something natural from happening because if you stop one animal catching another animal you've got to consider that you're depriving one animal of a meal that it otherwise would have had um i think in the penguin situation they decided that it was just um it was just a pointless um thing for all those penguins to die and i think that that was the distinction made there um, but it's natural to feel mm -hmm. sad about seeing animals die. Yeah, yeah, particularly particularly baby animals and things like that. So yeah, yeah. It's very <laughs> emotional. <laughs> so, what's been the most cha challenging thing that you found to film? Uh, so, this, without a doubt, because um, they're just so secretive in the wild, mm -hmm. um, and they're arboreal, so they mainly climb around in in trees. Um, which again makes them hard to see. So the main way I was able to film them was when, um, so I went uh, along with the, the Wildlife Trust for Bedfordshire, Cambridgeshire and Northamptonshire and the People's Trust for Endangered Species. And I went along when they were doing their monitoring scheme. So I was able to see all mice that they found in their monitoring boxes. But the thing is that they are, even that's quite rare, but to see them like that. And they're a protected species. So the licensed monitors have to be incredibly careful about how and how long they're holding the door mice for. So I can't just be like, oh, excuse me, can you move over there into the light so I can get a better shot or can you hold it like this or, you know, so it was all very opportunistic and ad hoc. Um, and 
at the end of the day, yeah, the Dormouse's welfare is at the top of everyone's priorities. So that's that's just how it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I think that answers another question that we've had, which is Verity, age six, wants to know if you've ever made a film of Dormice. And uh, we're going to be showing your lovely Dormouse film actually at the end today. <laughs> so that was a, that's a yes. Um, yes. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> is there anything that you're particularly keen to film that you haven't been able to yet? Oh, um, so globally, there are so many wildlife highlights that I would love to see and capture. Um, so it's difficult, but I think um, I think it'd be really cool to get footage of wolverines. So there, I mean, it'd be difficult because again, they they don't just come out and see you when you got a camera there. Um, but they're such charismatic mammals. Um, it would be amazing to, to footage to get. So I am going to um, an academic conference in Finland. Uh, next year, so maybe we'll see. Maybe. I might, might get a crossed. chance. <laughs> yes, fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> so my last question, um, and one that I'm asking all of our experts, is: uh, Do you have a top wildlife spot, or is there something that you're particularly keen to see? I mean, would you class a wolverine as that, or, or is there something else that you're really keen to see? I would definitely class a wolverine as that. Um, I think in terms of my um, favourite wildlife spot, it's, it's not my rarest, but it's, it's got to be my most unexpected. So I'm really into um, long train journeys. And last year I was into railing from Cambridge to Turkey. And uh, I was on an overnight train from Budapest to Bucharest. I just woke up in the morning, looked out at the scenery, which was incredible, um, and just looked down and, and by a stream there were three bears just playing um, and it's the first time I've ever seen bears in the wild and it was a complete surprise uh, so yeah. that was yeah that was just I was very excited I was over excited <laughs> about that yeah I think I was um, <laughs> so that was very cool in terms of other things I'd like to see so I was recently talking to another graduate student in the department his name is Charles Emigore and he works on white-bellied pangolins mm -hmm. um, and his work is brilliant and the way he works the talks about them is brilliant and He's definitely enthused me. So, so pangolins are another one. Yeah, oh, I'd love to see a pangolin, definitely. Well, thank you so much, Ellie, for all of that. And like I say, we're going to be showing Ellie's film about dormice at the end of the programme today. But I'm going to now um, uh, cut through to, hopefully, we'll be able to be joined by Francis Dipper. Hello, Francis. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Oh, oh. Fantastic. It's so to see you. Yeah. No, We've no. Made it. We've made it at last. Uh, thank you yes. so much for your film that you made for us. And I have to say, your garden pond is really, really beautiful. Um, is it there is a, a wonderful pond. It's a wonderful pond. <laughs> is there a particular time of year that you um, get excited about when it comes to looking at the wildlife in your pond? Oh, I think it has to be spring, mm -hmm. because that's when all the dragonfly larvae start emerging. And uh, then suddenly the place is full of colour and animals darting about here and there. And in fact, um, a few years ago, um, I managed to find at the edge of my pond, and I'm going to try and show you this now, in a minute, um, the, cast off, the cast off skin of one of those larvae. Now, let me get it in the right place. Oh, there we go. Now, yes, I can see that now. Yeah. That <laughs> and that animal had climbed up a stem and I watched it doing it, climbed up the stem and it just waited and then eventually the skin split and slowly, slowly out came the adult and that was in spring, so spring, yes. Yes, oh fantastic. So that links nicely to one of the questions that we've had on Twitter, which is, is there anything nastier than a dragonfly nymph? Oh, dragonfly larvae are pretty nasty because they can their prey but I think I can think of something nastier and that is the larva of a great diving beetle because that has huge jaws compared to its size of head and when it finds a tadpole or a little fish it will inject it with their jaws and it will put enzymes into the body which then digest the internal organs of its prey and then it sucks it all back in like soup. Now I think that's pretty nasty myself. Yeah, that sounds really, really gruesome. <laughs> now, I know that you're actually more of a marine ecologist than a freshwater ecologist, aren't you? Would you yeah, be able to yes. tell us a little bit more about your work? 
Well, nowadays, I actually spend most of my time writing books about marine biology and marine ecology for children and for the public. Um, but of course, to, um, to be able to write those, I've spent a lifetime diving in the seas in the UK, Australia, the United Arab Emirates and so on, um, in order to, to learn all this, um, working for various organisations, usually conservation. Um, but if you're interested, I can show you, of course, yes. one of my latest books. <laughs> what is, uh, does that show up? Yes, yes. Well, you want to hold it back a little bit more, yeah. <laughs> like that? Yeah, okay. perfect. Yeah, that's great. And that's for children, and I wrote that a couple of years ago. Um, and it's great fun because it's got some beautiful illustrations in it mm -hmm. by a very well-known artist called Alice Patulo. Okay. And then my biggest one for adults was the marine world. And that's a really big, big head. You want to know about anything living in the ocean, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> including, including, did you know there were bears in the ocean? Bears in the ocean. Bears <laughs> in the ocean, yes. And that's, uh, that's not like a great big furry bear, but microscopic little animals called tardigrades. Uh, and yes. they're some of the toughest things in the ocean. And they look just like miniature bears with six pairs of claws. So yeah. there you go. There <laughs> I do love tardigrades. They're, they're gorgeous little animals. So oh, we've had a, wonderful. Yeah, yeah, we've had a couple of questions that have come through from the audience. So right. um, this is, in your pond, do you have to make it acidic for any exotic pond creatures? Um, do I have to make it acidic? Yeah. Um, no, no, it's a natural pond, this one. So it's okay. a spring pond, a water level pond. It goes up and down with the water table. And so I, would, I don't do anything to it. I just leave mm -hmm. it and it does its own thing. We occasionally clear out round the edges so that it doesn't get too overgrown with, um, with rushes and so on. But otherwise we leave it strictly alone and we see what wildlife comes and goes, basically. Yeah, oh, wonderful, yeah. And uh, another question, Verity, aged six, asks, did we hear newt pole for a baby newt? Is that an official name for a baby newt? Well, Verity, I think it's a very good name for a baby newt, and I certainly use it. But whether it's a real word, I'm not so sure. But a newt pole to me is just the right name. Yes. <laughs> and another question, again from Verity, which you'd like to ask when the more chicks will hatch, more hen chicks will hatch. Well, they should be hatching right now because yeah. I've got one on my pond with a nest and I did see a baby one the other day, but sadly I also found one that hadn't made it. I think it had oh. fallen out of its nest and a lot yeah. of them do. They don't all survive, but I'm hoping very much to see a few more coming out of the pond very soon. Yeah, I think they're gorgeous, more hen chicks. Oh, they're, they're wonderful. Really Long fun. legs, very gorgeous, yes. Yes, yeah. <laughs> So, um, another thing is, uh, I think like many of us in the museum, you have your own collection of some interesting biological stuff, and you've shown us uh, one thing already. Have you got any other with any others with any interesting stories behind them? I have actually a whole cupboard full of them, but um, <laughs> I'll, I'll have to pick a few out. So, yeah. I think I'll show you a freshwater one first. Mm -hmm. Now, this one I collected just yeah. a few years ago and it is actually the shed skin of a grass snake and the whole thing is there from that's the head end mm -hmm. and the whole covering of everything so all snakes shed their skin and this one i happened to find before it had broken up and blown away so that's one of my favorite fish yeah and they are lovely I've got several marine ones, but this is a very easy one that you might find yourself on the shore. There's a tiny little shine. I'm trying to get it so it doesn't shine. Then I've oh, yes. seen that. Yeah, that's great. Then, yeah. yeah, with that little shell that I found on the beach and many others, if you manage to look very closely, it's got a sort of beveled edge to it. Mm. And you can tell from that that it's been eaten by another shell. See if we can get this one so it's not trying. How about that? Is yeah, that showing yeah, up? That's good. Yeah. So, so that's a moon shell or nectar shell. 
and it plows along in the sand and when it comes to one of those little bivalve shells it sits on it drills through it with its strong radula which is like a looks like a bit like a cheese grater mm -hmm. and some various chemical secretions and eventually it gets in there and again it will eat the liquefied contents of its prey and you find those all over the place those shells so next time you go down to a beach yeah. and are able to go to a beach then then look out for them I've got a, if I've got time, I've got another one. Yes, yes, this absolutely. One of my favourites. Way back, we used to live in the Middle East, and we went diving there. And one day, I went in for a dive, and I had, took a whole reel of film, and I was very happy. But when I got it home, I found that the, well, not home, even up, up onto the deck, I found that actually I'd forgotten to put a film in the camera. Oh, in no. those days, you you had to put film in. But what I had done was I'd collected this huge pearl oyster at the uh, time. Yeah. Doing a little research. I don't normally collect many things, but we were doing a little research into these and what lives in them. And so we then managed to open it. And inside you can maybe see that wonderful mother of pearl. Mm -hmm. And not only that, there was the tiniest, teeniest little pearl and I've stuck oh. it on some blue isn't it lovely? Oh, it's lovely. I've, stuck, I've stuck it on some blue tack because otherwise I might not be able to hold it. But there was a little pearl in that cell. And I've never forgotten that one. So that was a that was a marvellous piece. I can say hundreds of others, but I don't suppose you've got that much time, have you? <laughs> no, that's really wonderful. Thank you. I do have another question for you actually. Um which no. is What's the best solution to the very annoying duckweed? Do you have a solution for duckweed on ponds at all? The, the best solution is to try to keep your pond without too much debris in it. Okay. So try, try and clear it in the winter because it's the nitrates and all the, the nutrients from that that help the duckweed to grow. But apart from that, I, I'm afraid I just get a, a net and I sweep it across and I collect it put it on the side and let the animals crawl out for a couple of, of days and then I compost the, the duckweed and that works very well actually. Yes, okay, that's a really great tip and I've got one last question, which is one that I'm no. asking all of our experts this week, which is, do you have a top wildlife spot or is there something that you really want to see that you haven't been able to yet? Right, well, I'm fascinating, I don't mind what it is. But I have very luckily managed to achieve seeing one of my lifelong dreams, if you like, and that is to swim with a whale shark. And so a couple of years ago, we were out on the west coast of Australia, at Ningaloo Reef, and we did actually manage to swim with one of these wonderful creatures, the biggest fish in the entire ocean, at least 10 metres long, and there's some reliable records that say it might reach 20 metres long. And that was a real experience to see these these gentle giants. So that would certainly be my um, my top spot Fantastic. if I hadn't already achieved it. <laughs> but um, I'm quite happy to see anything new. That that's the whole interest of this sort of life is to to, to spot new things. Well, thank you so much, Francis. That has been really fascinating, and thank you for showing us your pond earlier as well. It, like I say, it's really beautiful. Um, You're and uh, welcome. Yes, <laughs> thank you very much. So sorry for all the technical issues we've had today and if you had questions but haven't been able to ask them because you didn't manage to find this new stream, don't worry, just send them in to us and we'll see what we can do about getting answers for you. But now I have one last treat, something very special. So Ellie Bladen, our wildlife filmmaker we were talking to earlier, um, has sent through her film about dormice, and this is really beautiful, so I hope you enjoy it. Shh! They're sleeping. I don't know exactly where they are, but I know they're here, just snuggling down under the leaf litter, waiting for it to warm up a bit. I'm here in the beautiful Brampton Wood, the home of a very special little animal. It's a rodent which has shed the negative connotations that usually come with rats and mice and it seals the heart of anyone who sees it. If you haven't guessed yet, 
I am of course talking about the Dormouse. Nestled in the heart of Cambridgeshire, Brampton Wood has been a significant focal point for surrounding communities for over 900 years. It was even mentioned in the Doomsday Book. In 1993, Brampton Wood gained new significance when it became the site of the UK's first ever official Dormouse reintroduction project, carried out by the People's Trust for Endangered Species. And still to this day, because of an ongoing monitoring programme by the Wildlife Trust for Bedfordshire, Cambridgeshire and Northamptonshire, we know that right now there are dormice hibernating in these woods. After all, we couldn't call them dormice if they didn't sleep a lot of the time. The door in Dormouse comes from the French for sleep, cementing their reputation as lazy little so-and-sos. But really, they're not lazy. They're perfectly adapted to a seasonal temperate climate, and their long winter sleeps are a great way to survive the chilly period when there's not much food around. Many people watching this will probably never have seen a Dormouse in the flesh, and neither have I, but over the next few months I'm hoping to get lucky because I'm going to be following the people who work so hard to keep the Dormouse thriving in this wood, the people who maintain the habitat, the people who monitor it on the ground, and the people who crunch that all-important ecological data. So come with me and meet the Dormouse dream team of Brampton Wood. The sites that I could choose to discover more about Dormice are unfortunately few and far between. Dormouse numbers have been declining for at least 100 years, and since 2000, they are thought to have decreased by 38%. Luckily, thanks to the Dormouse reintroduction in 1993, Brampton is bucking that trend. The People's Trust for Endangered Species were looking for suitable sites where they might be able to thrive. Brampton seemed like a good place. It's one of Cambridge's largest areas of ancient woodland. It's got loads of trees and shrubs that would be good for Dormouse food. Sounds like plain sailing, right? Well, not so much because Dormouse reintroductions are a delicate business. So assuming that you've got your location, where does the reintroduction programme go from there? After Dormouse are coming out of hibernation, the, there's a meeting of the, the captive breeders. All those Dormouse are then brought to, to that meeting and then from there they're separated out um, to go into quarantine. Then after six weeks, it's usually about towards the end of June, though the Dormice are then taken up to the woodland that's been selected. In the time they've been in quarantine, the volunteers have been out, they've put up some soft release cages in the, in, attached to the trees. Dormice are paired up, put in those cages um, and then they're left there for 10 days to, for, so they get used to the sounds and noises of the woodland. Um, during that time they're obviously provided food on a daily basis and they're given water. After 10 days, a small ho hole is opened in the cage and the dormice are then free to kind of come and go. That's amazing, but it's a really long process. So are there any risks involved that it just might not work after all that? Yeah, there's always risks in these things. It can fail at a number of, number of reasons. One is, is for whatever reason, we might have not enough dormice come out, so uh, we don't have enough dormice to put into the woodland. Um, it might be that the uh, people that manage the woodland, they haven't managed their volunteers very well, uh, or it could just be that we have a poor year and we have poor weather and the dormice simply don't survive. But probably the, the biggest negative thing is actually if, if the woodland management work isn't undertaken for any reason, that seems to have the most negative impact on the long-term survival of the dormice population. Woodland management is so important because dormice rarely come down to the ground. They move around using interconnecting branches from trees and shrubs, so if these are lost there's no way of them getting around to find shelter or food. And speaking of food, a very dander story provides a rich diet containing some of their favourite foods like hazelnuts and blackberries. We're standing in the middle of a ride surrounded by amazing wildflower patches, but I'm guessing that it doesn't naturally look like this. So what do you do? So this area is actively managed. If we just left this to its own devices, it would turn into woodland. We have to keep it mown short, but we can't mow it all short because the wildlife doesn't appreciate it. So we regularly mow the center um, and that's for access. And then we leave longer areas to the side, um, but we don't cut them all in one year. We actually cut one side one year and then the other side the other year. And that gives us a range of different habitat height. And within that, there's different wildflowers. And it also gives somewhere for the invertebrates to overwinter. But then outside of that, we've got early successional phase. And it's where the coppice occurs of hazel and ash and blackthorn. But that's done on an eight year cycle. This area is done this year, another one next door, another one on the opposite side, a bit further down. 
anything that appreciates that yearly young growth. Um, and that's really where you get the brambles coming through, which are quite easily shaded out over time. Well, we've only walked a few metres and it already looks so different. So what's yeah. going on here? This area here, we're now coming through into a, the coppice cycle. So we are stood amongst four or five year old hazel stems and it's on an eight year cycle. So it'll be cut within the next three or four years. This area offers a different habitat type. The benefits that we get from this short phase is that we get a lot of this young growth coming seven, eight foot tall in a few years brambles occurring right the way through it and the but as the hazel gets older seven eight years it starts to produce hazelnuts and that's obviously a food source for dormice to fatten up for the winter months as that hazel gets older and more mature then it's it's more likely to support uh, the hazel dormice within the sort of stems itself and behind all this i can see there are some really big trees so what's yeah. going to happen over there this is a much longer phase of management within the wood that's on a 20 to 25 year cycle. That will be higher forest, um, but not big mature trees. So there's some beautiful old specimens within the wood. But this young growth here, it's done on a shorter phase and that supports a different range of habitat opportunities for many different species. By keeping this sort of diverse mosaic of different age structures across the wood, it really does benefit the different biodiversity levels. As I learnt from Aidan, a huge amount of work goes into maintaining this woodland for biodiversity, including, of course, the Dormouse. But is it just enough to create the habitat and hope for the best? Well, the Wildlife Trust don't think so, because they also have a thorough monitoring programme to track the Dormouse population. They do this by putting these boxes out around the wood, 200 of them in total. And it might just look like a few pieces of wood nailed together, but they're a really good place for dormice to rest and have their young during the summer. And they're actually really specialised. This box is called the Brampton because it was invented right here. And its special features include a hole underneath rather than round the back, which is great for drainage if it's been very rainy, and this special piece of mesh, which means that you can have a look at what's inside before you open it up. With so many of these boxes around the wood and them being so specialised that you're not going to find it in the supermarkets, where do they get them all from? Well, yet again, the trust gets by with a little help from their friends. And in this case, I'm talking about a team of volunteers who are box making extraordinaires. But don't think that all these volunteers must be DIY fanatics. Some of them are school children. We know that schools have so much to fit into the curriculum, so why did you decide to partner with the Wildlife Trust and do this? So it's a really fantastic opportunity for us to work with a local wildlife charity um, and it's really great in that the project ties in very, very nicely with our curriculum. So there are woodworking skills there, there are measuring skills, a little bit of maths. So we can really incorporate this great community project with our curriculum, it ties in very well. So once these boxes have been finished, they're spaced out around the wood, ready to be used for dormice to make their nests. And then the Wildlife Trust checks them every year to monitor the population. It's an important part of checking that this woodland continues to be good for these fuzzy little icons. I found you in the midst of a load of activity because your volunteers have just turned up for your first survey of the year. But I know that this isn't the only thing you do. So can you talk me through a year in the life of the monitoring programme? So the dormouse monitoring year actually starts in the winter while the dormice are still asleep hibernating. And during that time we go around and do a box check. So we go up around to all our boxes, any are damaged we replace them with nice new boxes. And then we also clear out the old boxes so if there's any debris or old nests from last year just to make them nice and clean and inviting for when the dormice wake up. Fast forward to summer, so we're starting the surveys now in May uh, and we'll do monthly box checks from now until October. Um, we'll just go around all the boxes recording where we find dormice, where we find the nests, any other animals we find. Your diary is absolutely packed, <laughs> but I imagine that even with the best planning in the world, there are difficulties. So what would you say is the hardest thing about the programme? One of the hardest things about monitoring dormice is that you pick up quite a low number of the animals that are actually present. So they live at quite low population density to start with and then also we're only picking them up when they're actually using the boxes. So there may be lots of dormice that are using natural nesting sites around the wood. This all sounds like a huge amount of work <laughs> for a species that a lot of people will never see. So why do you care so much about the dormice? Dormice are a really important species. They're what we call an indicator species. So that means when we have dormice, it's an indicator that our woodlands are for really good habitat quality. 
So they're very much habitat specialists. They need a wide range of food plants. They also need really good habitat structure. So it's just an indicator that our woodland's really good for door mice. It'll also be really good for a wide range of other species. Would you be happy to take me out onto the reserve with your survey party and hopefully we can see one? Yeah, that's absolutely fine. Fingers crossed we'll find one. At every survey, Gwen is joined by a vital team of volunteers. With 200 boxes in the wood that need to be checked, people power is key. Dormice are protected by law, meaning that it is illegal to harm or disturb dormice in their nests. So each volunteer survey group needs at least one licensed handler in their midst. Training for a license can take years because a candidate needs to prove to two existing license holders that they are competent to handle and survey dormice at every life stage before they're recommended for their license. As well as learning how to safely handle dormice, they need to learn how to collect biological data about them, which is vital for the monitoring scheme as it shows the health of the population. I followed Gwen and her crack team of volunteers around the wood, carefully checking each box in our section. Come rain or shine, the teams complete their checks. And this being the UK, we experienced just about every type of weather in one session. After checking 50 boxes, we had found nothing but a few empty nests, most left long ago by birds, but one containing a trio of fragile wren chicks and another still occupied by an angry hornet. But suddenly our luck changed. This is really exciting. We just had a call from another volunteer group in the wood saying that they found a dormouse in the nest. So we're gonna run along and see if we can get there in time. This lucky team found a dormouse in one of their boxes. So it's time to carefully process it and collect that important data. Yeah. First, the dormouse is gently held while the licensed handler checks their sex, age and breeding status. We can tell that this one is an adult female with no signs of being pregnant or with babies. She's weighed in one of these bags, which gives a good indication of her health. This individual is nice and heavy, meaning that she's managing to find a good amount of food in the wood, just what we want to see. The data won't just be used to determine the health of the dormice at Brampton. It's also submitted to the National Dormouse Monitoring Programme, run by the People's Trust for Endangered Species, so that they can build a picture of dormouse health nationwide. When I embarked on this journey at Brampton, I knew there was a chance that I wouldn't see a dormouse at all. After all, they're shy, they're secretive, and like all good things in life, they're very hard to predict. Which is why seeing my first dormouse today was so exciting. As a scientist, I understand why the dormouse is such an important indicator species. If we lose the dormouse from our woodlands, we lose a lot more besides. But just on a human level, seeing the dormouse today was so moving. I can completely see why it's love at first sight for so many people. And having met the volunteers who spend so much of the year looking after these little creatures, I thought it was only right to hand over the end of the film to them to ask them why they do what they do. I volunteer here because I've been coming in here since I was a kid and by volunteering on a do dormouse project you get the chance to see a creature that you would otherwise never see in the wild. I'm doing my bronze DV and this is a great experience. Lovely just being out in a natural environment and then of course you've got the dormouse themselves. It is sometimes like a little bit searching for a needle in a haystack. We don't always find dormouse, but when we do, you've got the thrill of finding what is actually quite a rare endangered species. So I love what the wildlife trust do. I love dormouse and it's an opportunity to get out and do my bit. I love nature and nature is really important to me and to all of us. But despite that, wildlife populations have more than halved in my lifetime. That's why the work that the Wildlife Trust does to protect places like this is so important. I'm a Key Stage 1 teacher, so um, it's lovely to get outdoors and do something different. I was also diagnosed with breast cancer three years ago, and actually doing this sort of thing was my sanity and helped me to recover and has kept me really positive. What a wonderful project taking place in Cambridgeshire and thank you Ellie for sharing that film with us. That's all we've got time for on Zoology Live today, but do join us tomorrow when we'll be exploring the wonderful world of British birds. And remember to check out our blog for details of this week's programme and the challenges that we've set. We look forward to seeing you again soon.